Hello, everyone. I'm Shannon Wilkins, and I'm so happy to talk to you for a few minutes about the state of arts integration and also the role of museums in the future, thinking specifically about this one. About five years ago, I did a lot of thinking about Common Core State Standards, and that's because one of the jobs that I do in addition to the arts is train principals. So this was a huge difference in how we teach in America, and the biggest difference is in America, because we had 50 different sets of standards and 50 different tests. So for the first time in the history of the nation, we came to this as a nation. Huge sea change. Trying to find out more about this new world that we were going into, I really needed to find some direction. So the person who really helped to guide my thinking about the arts and how they fit into this new world called Common Core was none other than one of the principal authors, David Coleman, who said, in an encouraging way, the great news is that the Common Core standards call on so many things the arts do well. Well, that certainly perked my interest. And so I immediately set to writing and reading and tearing apart uh, an article that he wrote called The Seven Guiding Principles for the Arts. And that particular um, paper that he wrote has been guiding me along on a daily basis ever since. At the same time that we were starting to the reboot into a, a national view of education, we were also beginning to realize that education had changed due to the internet, and we needed to revamp how we taught children to use in an age of digital information where information is now infinite. So the idea that we can memorize and use the old kinds of style of learning doesn't work when information keeps multiplying by the second in front of you. So we certainly needed a new paradigm for how do we incorporate this massive amount of information. So once we had to invent something, which became the 21st century learning skills. So we gave you skills to deal with the massive amount of information rather than teach you and have you memorize a set body of information. This all kind of came together in a professional learning series that was originally designed just for principals and assistant superintendents. And we, the first two years that we had it, we didn't let a teacher in the room because we wanted it to be a safe learning place for principals to learn a new vision and a new pedagogi pedagogical style for learning. And the series is called Teaching Creativity with Common Core State Standards, and a good number of you in the room have been through the series. Um, there are three sessions in it. The first session we work with integrating into the Common Core State Standards in English Language Arts. The second, we work on STEM to STEAM, project-based learning, and we also give you some tools on, on how to make uh, integration of technology part of your learning environment. And the last one was leading the change, which is about building resources for school administrators at that time, but school leaders in a broader context to help implement it at the site level. We built it based upon the Kennedy Center definition. This was the definition that we found six years ago that we thought really met our purposes. One of the concerns that we had is that, as many people have talked about, is that art was not going to take a back seat to any of the other content areas. And with this particular definition, what we saw is that the two sets of standards go side by side, and they work to evolve understanding in both of the content areas. You teach both. I'm very happy to say that this year, after five years of uh, running the program, we have won a Golden Bell Award. And in Los Angeles County, we also <laughs> won an Educator Excellence Award. So we're very pleased to have that acknowledgment. And based upon what's going on, we've decided to once again repeat the series next year. We um, have it at the Huntington Library and Gardens. And we have about a space for 100 people, and we fill that every single year and with a waiting list. And uh, we're continuing to do that, which tells us that there are new teachers coming into the fold. There are new administrators coming into the fold. We know there's a high retirement rate with baby boomers. So the need is still there to hear this from an initial, uh, initial view of it. Now, I don't want to give you the idea that this has been a rosy and easy journey, because it has not been. 
And the biggest opposition to this notion of arts integration, when I first started to put those two words together six years ago, were my own colleagues who are secondary arts educators. Their greatest fear is that if we go hand in hand with another content area, we are going to become the handmaidens of the other content area, and that isn't where we ever want to be. We want to be equal forces in the, in the core curriculum, which of course we are, but an understandable fear. And I think that that whole fear really comes together about how do we prepare our teachers to teach arts in our education system. So if you are a secondary teacher, your undergraduate major is in the content area that you teach, and you have a single subject credential, and you teach art, whatever form that may be, as your class. So if you're a music teacher, you teach music all day long. That's what your credential to teach, and that's what your education is in. But in arts integration, we were really thought we would start with elementary, and that's because that teacher is in charge of teaching everything. So our next struggle is the greatest challenge, which is my colleagues in secondary said, so what about us? So we're beginning to start a new series for secondary education, which deals with teaching with art objects and tying the curriculum that they learn on a regular basis when they're learning about the history, the culture, the religions of the world in and using art objects to make that come alive. Now I have a hypothesis here that the generation that we kind of look at when we can see their eyes may be the best generation for reading visual narrative. And can you see why I think that? You all recognize this. They, they go through hundreds and hundreds of images a day sent from friends and um, posted on Facebook that tell a story. I think this could be something. This could really be something. So my goal here is to make <laughs> Make what I think is a very strong learning modality for sixth through 12th graders and take objects that are in museums that teach them about the world and cultures and civilization and somehow make it relevant and alive to them. I'm inspired by one of my favorite movies. I don't know if you have seen Monuments Men. It's called, and this, art, this uh, quote just I love, art is the story of our lives painted on canvas and etched in stone, right? Civilizations, every civilization, every generation. We had an extraordinary time here about a month ago working with the Getty Education Specialist and the Getty Research Institute, learning about the Temple, the temple Caves of Duong, which is one of the world's historic sites right here on exhibit right now. It was an extraordinary arts learning experience for all of us. And for us, the challenge of tracing the, the effect of the Silk Road into Western civilization and right into our secondary classrooms has become a challenge that we began to just scratch into a little bit a month ago. The room with me chose a few pieces of art that they thought really traced the effects of the Silk Road into Western art. This is one of them, of course, the chinois effect. Everyone in the world's got something blue and white in their house, or you just aren't chic at all. <laughs> And so looking at doing some contour drawing and having them do closer observations to realize, well, wait a minute, those are scenes of Japanese and, or Chinese life on that. And, but it was in the court of Louis XIV. I'm confused, right? That inquiry, why is that? And we looked at, um, there is a whole tapestry series I hope that you will go and see called the Emperor of, of China series from the court of Louis XIV, which gives us a very interesting view into the, into the cultural lifestyle of the monarchy versus those of the servants. And, and you can certainly see that they're dressed as uh, Chinese in here. And there's blue and white porcelain, a great inquiry for beginning to study. Well, what was it like? in the court of Louis XIV, and what was the effect of the self road on that experience. And of course, my dear friend Andrew chose this painting for us to look at, because in the caves you study the sacred art of Buddha in that particular situation, and then tracing it to Western civilization, we look at the life of Christ and its depiction in Western art. This is the adoration of the Magi, and um, as you can note, if you look carefully, one of the three kings has a precious Chinese porcelain cup that he's giving. So you can see the effects of 
the Silk Road straight into Western civilization and probably straight into your home right now where you, some of it is still lingering. We hope to capture it, we hope to make it relevant, and we hope to keep art alive because as Winston Churchill said, when asked to cut funding in favor of the war effort, he simply replied, then what are we fighting for? Thank you.